Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast, and this is the final episode of the uh, year uh, of 2019. And uh, hopefully uh, you have enjoyed the podcast uh, during 2019. And if you have, I would love it if you would go to wealthformula.com and follow the prompts there where it says, leave us a five-star review. Um, you know, it's easy for people to say they don't like something and make a review. Uh, it's uh, it's one, another thing to enjoy something and take the effort to go over there and give us a shout out. In the new year, I think what I'd like to do is start reading some of those reviews online. So please go to wealthformula.com and do it. Those reviews along with subscriptions and all sorts of things are what keeps our rankings the way they are, keeps high quality guests on the show, et cetera. Now, uh, as uh, for this week, I want to talk about some I've talked about on this show before a little bit. You know, last summer I had a drug reaction uh, that made me pretty sure that I was a goner, that I was I was toast. And there was, you know, nothing terribly remarkable about the day that it happened. Uh, you know, and that's the weird thing, right? So my wife and I, uh, we were there, we were in Minnesota visiting my parents with her kids. It was their last evening there. I stayed up a little bit later uh, that night to, to chat with my parents and, you know, the kids were already asleep. My wife was already downstairs uh, where we usually stay. So I started heading down. I started to feel a little funny as I started to walk down those stairs. And the next thing you know, I get to the bottom uh, of the stairs and I couldn't stand anymore. And I felt completely disoriented. It was very strange. It was sort of dissociated. Uh, and then within 20 minutes, um, you know, I was getting loaded up into the back of an ambulance. And I remember seeing uh, the doors close uh, onto the outside world there from the ambulance. And I honestly was sitting there looking at that thinking, oh, my God, is that the last time I'm ever going to see outside? Seriously, this is what was going through my head, right? Now, I just want to emphasize that there was nothing unusual about that day. Nothing, right? I didn't feel weird and then have the chronic problem of any kind that would make uh, things come crashing to an end. It just happened, you know? And during that ride to the hospital, all I could think of was whether or not I was going to leave my family in good financial shape. Had I prepared them for this? And of course, you know, this whole thing ends up being a false alarm. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking about it. However, again, it illustrates the idea that unexpected things happen to people all the time. You know, a lot of these things happen to people and boom, the next thing you know, the family has to deal with a problem that they hadn't expected and, you know, a day before, they had no clue it was coming, and and then all of a sudden, there's the reality. Because, you know, listen, life is full of uncertainties, but death is not one of them. The only question is when. And despite that, very few people give this topic much thought. That is, the topic of helping your friend, your family transition as easy as possible, and uh, making it easier on your loved ones. Why? Well. You know, it's a good question, and I'll tell you that part of it, and I know this to be true from talking to some people, is they're feeling a little superstitious, right? Maybe the idea of estate planning may hasten uh, their demise or something like that. I know people who think that way. They don't necessarily admit it, but that's what sort of comes out. And then there's, of course, others who probably make up most of the uh, group um, that really just have no clue that there's anything that needs to be done or have been misguided, um, which is, you know, a lot of people, it, you, you, even if you're highly educated, I mean, if you're highly educated, you have a lot of money, unless somebody tells you this stuff, how are you going to know? Anyway, so maybe you fit in that category. The good news for you is that there are some very obvious things you should do now for estate planning, regardless of your age and health. Um, you, you've got you've got to do these things, and they're relatively simple and inexpensive, so that's the good news. 
And for people with larger estates, you know, this kind of planning uh, becomes, I don't know if it's more important, but it becomes financially more impactful as uh, the issue of estate taxes comes into the picture that can rob your children and your, um, your family of all of your hard-earned wealth. These are the issues that we're going to talk about on this week's Wealth Formula podcast with our guest, Joe Longo, when we come back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula podcast is Joseph Longo. Uh, for more than 25 years, Joe is focused on delivering unparalleled service in the areas of estate planning, asset protection, and sports. Uh, his clients have ranged from businesses to high net worth families and professional athletes. In addition to practicing law, uh, Joe uh, is uh, also uh, in the sports agent space, which is really interesting, and has represented uh 22 first round draft picks, which I think is pretty darn cool. He himself was once a starting defense back at uh, Brown University uh, as a football player in the mid 80s. Joe, welcome to Wealth Formula Podcast. Thank you, Buck. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Joe, what was it like to uh, what was it like to play uh, Division One football back in the 1980s? Yeah, well, we're 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 going on plus 30 years now, so. <laughs> I, yeah, it's hard yeah. to remember, but yeah. I tell you what, for a guy from Los Angeles, it was it was a great joy in my life. I still have very good friends from teammates in that time. But, you know, for me, uh, Brown was in Providence, Rhode Island. So to go see all those schools and all those great yeah. cities as a young man, it was it was great. I had a really good time. I, I really enjoyed my time there at Brown. Well, that's great. So uh, and, and I, wa- I want to talk a little bit about sort of your journey. Um, before we get into sort of the nuts and bolts, because um, we talked about your practice and I thought it was kind of neat. You've, you've taken that, um, you know, that experience in sports and you've sort of, you know, relayed that into being an agent. How did, how did you end up ultimately sort of in the, um, you know, estate planning space? Yeah, it's a great question. I get to ask that a lot because I have a somewhat of a odd practice, you know, I hear about a lot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm uh, about to hit my 30th anniversary as being an attorney in June. And um, when I first started, I was a business litigator at a law firm and I was probably six or seven years out into my practice. And we had a uh, Dodger reliever case come into the firm. And my, my boss said, I know you know who he is because you read the sports page all day, every day. <laughs> so you, this will yeah. be your client. And uh, I ended up taking on his case and we ended up, you know, litigating for a year and a half, became very good friends. He turned to me at the end of that case and said, I'd like you to be my agent. And that sort of opened the door to, uh, I had a sports bent anyways. So um, I never, I, I, I began becoming a MLB certified agent. And then um, I never, I never did give up my law practice. It just evolved from business litigation to some probate litigation and then I had a client, uh, an outfielder for the Padres, uh, pass away in a car accident. And uh, I got to experience on behalf of his wife and children, you know, the probate process. And I said to myself, and this is probably about 20 years ago, how, how do these guys all not have living trusts? This is crazy that we're stuck in probate for so long. Um, yeah. You know, I really need to get, everybody needs to get a living trust because it would make life on your loved ones so much easier and ultimately, um, I, I, I joined a group of estate planners, and my practice has been in that direction ever since. And I enjoy it very much because, you know, you're, I feel like you're really helping people. Um, you're certainly helping the loved ones of your clients. And, and I also enjoy, you know, the tax aspects of estate planning as well. And so, um, you know, it's a really fulfilling area of law. And, it, and all my athlete clients need the same type of planning as you know, the business owners and the you know, doctors and I have lawyers as clients, every all walks of life. And so uh, both practices dove, you know, uh, mesh together nicely and uh, and I enjoy it. That's kind of how I got here. So um, at a high level, let's back up and ask the question, what exactly, how would you define estate planning and really what are its primary objectives? <clears throat> it's it, it, 
estate planning is the planning you do for when you're gone. Like what's the old saying? Death and taxes, right? So we, we do spend a lot of time during our life planning on taxes, but you know, estate planning is the planning for your exit. And it's really, you know, most people uh, want to be responsible and, and care for their loved ones upon their passing because we all didn't work so hard to, you know, to, to, to put together all these assets and not take care of our family when we exit. And in my area of law, I deal with it on a da daily basis. People, you know, pass away and the people to do the planning, it sure is a lot easier on your loved ones versus the people who don't do any planning. Because, you know, there are people who go through life and say, well, when I pass away, that's not my problem, you know, and, and, and that's okay. That's, that's, that's one view. But I think the responsible thing to do, do the planning, get a living trust and at a minimum, and, and, and that way your loved ones are taken care of when you pass. So, you know, in my mind, I think of, of estate planning, the primary objectives really are twofold. One is uh, to avoid probate. And then the other, if you uh, have a large enough estate to avoid the taxes. We talked about probate, probate a few times and we've mentioned that. Will you tell us exactly, I mean, listen, a lot of people don't even know what probate is. Otherwise, they would not end up in probate, right? Um, like your, your professional athlete that you talked about, if, if, if he had known about it, he probably would have done, taken steps to avoid it. What Absolutely. is probate? Absolutely, he would have. Um, probate is the, the court monitoring the, the distributions of the decedent's assets. Okay, somebody's got to keep an eye on it, and that's how you do it. That's how the courts, courts once you pass, and if you don't have a living trust, uh, or you don't have any documents, or maybe you just have a will, in California anyways, and in most states, you'll end up in probate. Okay, and that's where the court's overseeing the distribution of your payment of your debts, payment of your taxes, and then the distribution of your assets. Because if we didn't have any probate court, you can imagine what would happen is it would just be a free for all. And, I, and I've actually had cases where somebody passes away, an elderly person passes away with no spouse, no kids, no family. You know, the house sits vacant until somebody files a probate action to distribute the assets to whatever heirs. And, and for instance, um, it's a very long process. Um, it can be a very expensive process with court costs and attorney's fees. Um, and on your loved ones, um, you know, it just prolongs the closure or, you know, um, because like, for instance, in LA County, where I'm based, uh, probate takes about a year and a half. Okay. I know in some states it's much quicker, but, you know, it's a year and a half of, of, until the court actually can grant the final order and you can distribute the assets. If you have a living trust, you can distribute, you could, you could likely pay the debts and distribute the assets in a matter of weeks at a fraction of the cost. And by the way, it's, if you have a living trust, it's private. Nobody gets to call your attorney and find out what share did I get or what am I entitled to. Um, in a probate action, it's all public. It's all public record. Um, you can just Google Jackie Kennedy and right now and you can, her, her will will pop up on the internet and you can see what she left her friends and in, in it with a living trust, it's all private. The transactions are all private and you get a, it's a custom document where you can leave um, whatever assets you want to your loved ones. So if you have, okay, so backing up just a little bit, we have, um, you know, the bare minimum, ultimately, I think for anybody who's making pretty much any money at all is a will and a living trust. Um, you've talked about the living trust as a way to circumvent this thing called probate. Probate, basically, it's, you know, uh, for, for your loved ones, it's time, significant expense in some cases, maybe 4 or 5% of an estate even. Um, and then they have to deal with you dying, right? You want to avoid probate. So if you would, tell us exactly the role of the will then and what is the role of the living trust and how are those how are those differentiated and how do those work together? Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, a will originally was the document that you would put all your bequests in when you passed away, okay? Um, then a, a and, and that, that has to be probated, by the way. 
If you have a will and no living trust, it does have to go through the probate process. Okay. <clears throat> so basically it means that that means that it going through, it's basically saying, okay, it's a will. The, the court is going to uh, basically say that this is a will that is, uh, that, that, it, that we are saying is okay. Right? That's exactly I mean, that, right. That, that, right. Okay. That's the and first step. That the court's going to confirm that this is a valid will. Now we're going to follow yeah. the terms of the will. Okay. Let's get the creditors paid. Let's get the, you know, and then the heirs paid. Now, what the law said is if you have a living trust, you don't have to go through the probate practice uh, process. Why? Because it's like a contract. Okay. And if the contract is validly executed and the provisions in it are valid and aren't contrary to any existing laws, then you now are authorized to distribute these assets outside of the probate process. And, 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 you know, it, it also helps streamline the process which is what courts want. The goal is to streamline the process, not to make heirs wait a year and a half to finish distributing the assets, okay? Um, so that's the difference. You can look at a trust like a contract uh, that allows you to avoid probate. The will, it's like a living trust because it's got the provisions in there for the heirs, but it must go through the probate. But you still need both though, right? I mean, you still need both. the will and the living trust? Okay, yeah, how do they work together? In California, we call a living trust supported by a will, a pour over will. Okay, so what that means is if anything isn't properly disposed of through the living trust, then the will says, basically in layman terms, uh, court, please follow the terms of the living trust. Okay, pour over, meaning any assets that go through the will get poured over into the living trust and go through the terms of the living trust. Okay, so bottom line is, and this is the, the really big take home, and this is going to cover probably 90% of the people who are listening to this podcast. You have to have a will, you have to have a living trust, and a living trust is actually not that burdensome. Can you talk a little bit about sort of, you know, you know once you have a living trust, how do you use it? Well, that's a, it's, it's, this, is a, this is a good question too, because when you have a living, a lot of people think, well, I just need to do a living trust. And this is probably, this is why I would recommend more a qualified attorney handling your estate plan versus one of those self-help companies. Because I get this all the time where somebody comes into my office and says, you know, my mother passed away, but, but here's her living trust from, you know, one of those self-help, what do it yourself. And I say, um, and then I find out that none of the assets got title, titled into the trust. Because, you know, the home's not in the name of the trust. The bank accounts aren't in the name of the trust. So I said, you know what? The good news is she tried. You know, she had a little, the bad news is she didn't fund the trust. And she didn't put anything right. in it. So we have to go to probate court. So, so a really good estate plan has a living trust, like you said, with a pour over will that protects anything that didn't make it into the trust. And then you title all your assets in the name of that trust. So don't... If you, if you just do the trust, you don't put anything in it, it won't work. You've got to do the trust and then put your assets in the name of the trust. That's how you do it. And any common and this is actually, will help you. And that's actually, this is a really in, important point, I think, because I think that, you know, people get all these docs and they don't end up using them. And ultimately what I find, uh, what I've found is the reality is that even if you use really good attorneys, you use, you know, uh, people who are, um, you know, know what they're doing. Uh, a lot of times the documentation is created and then there's not a lot of education that goes um, to the client thereafter. And so in this case, really what we're talking about is not something terribly complicated because the living trust, at least in, um, in a, and if I say anything wrong, correct me, but you know, you don't need a tax ID number, et cetera. You're just using social security number, but instead of you owning it, Anytime you're, you know, deeding something, buying something, say you're investing in a private placement, it's not you anymore. It is, you know, uh, a Django uh, living trust. And this, you know, your social security number, just adding living trust to there basically funded the trust. Is that, is that right? Yeah, you, you know what? You hit the nail on the head. You explained it perfectly. Right. And then to go one step further, I tell clients, after you're done with me and we 
fund the trust properly, if you're getting any statements, mail on any of your investments or any of your properties or any of your bank accounts that have your name and not in the name of the trust, then we miss something. All of, you, right. all of your assets should be the name in the trust. So, so when you're getting those monthly statements or quarterly statements, when you're getting those private placement deals that you invested in, those should all become in, the, in, in you as trustee of your living trust. If it's just coming in your name, we, we probably, it's probably not in the trust. And, and just to add one more layer to that, because I think, you know, we get into so much complexity on the asset protection side. And as you know, uh, we, um, you know, I, I use Doug Lott as a, a friend. And he's the one who actually uh, suggested we talk. But, um, you know, we use a lot of this asset protection, LLCs, et cetera. One thing that I, uh, I have to admit that I have terribly careful of myself is to, instead of using my own name as a member on in, in a particular uh, partnership uh, or owner in an LLC, I've used my own name instead of using my living trust. And that's a mistake, isn't it? Uh, yeah, that is a mistake. You, 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 when you look at those, those type of deals, let's just say it's a group and you own 2% of this deal. Um, if you notice when they send you the um, operating agreement and they have the members listed there, a lot of people have it proper in their trust, but then you see individual names. And I always wonder, well, why don't they have it in trust? It needs to be in the trust, okay? Right. Or what you can do asset protection wise is you can do your investments in an LLC owned by your living trust. Okay, so, right. so have the living trust, have it be a single member LLC owned by your living trust. That way, if anything happens to you, your loved ones just, you know, now they're there, they have access now to this LLC that you set up. And, and, and a living trust can own your membership interest in the LLC, and it should. Yeah, and just, just for example, we have LLCs, my wife and me, where um, the, you know, it's, it's a partnership between us where the LLC is actually the membership is owned by my living trust and her living trust. There you go. Perfect. And um, anyway, that's, that's kind of what I was getting at because I think that's one more layer where I think people are not using the trust once they have them. Um, so I think we've got a pretty good idea that everybody needs for the most part, you know, a will and a living trust. And I don't care what state you live in, you're going to need that. At what point is a will and a living trust uh, living trust no longer sufficient for ad adequate estate planning. It, 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 at first glance, it's probably uh, when your assets are above the federal, uh, and some states have this too, uh, the federal death tax exemption, which is currently around 11.4 million. Um, and so, if your assets exceed that amount, okay, it's your it's your children. That would owe the debt tax, which is currently the exemption is about 11.4 million, and then you owe 40% on every dollar above that. So, just let me give you a quick example, and this is an extreme example. Um, you know, when a sure. sports franchise owner passes away, okay, and and typically he, he you know, there was an NFL team owner in, in Buffalo, and it was written about, you know, he was one of the original owners of that team, and it, I think his basis was like four million dollars to get into the league. Well, of course, when he died, the team was worth over a billion dollars, okay? So mm -hmm. on that asset, and I'm sure you had other assets, you, you put all those assets in what's called a 706 death tax return, okay? And then you put the value of all those assets, okay? So his wife had predeceased him, so it was his children owed 40% on every dollar above 11.4 million. Now, some people are like, well, uh, that's a lot of money, even on a $20 million estate. Yeah, it's 40% on every dollar, about $9 million there. So do the math and your children on that. How do we get around that? There's some advanced estate planning techniques that you can do. For instance, gifting some assets during your lifetime to your children. Um, sometimes life insurance, you can buy a policy and then the proceeds will cover the death tax. There's probably more that you need added to your estate plan once you exceed the 11.4 million. By the way, for a married couple, you can double that. Okay, so like 22.8 million can go to your kids tax-free uh, as long as you have a properly drafted joint trust. 
okay? So, so that's when you need more advanced um, estate planning to avoid death taxes. <clears throat> One other thing I might mention, in addition to a living trust and a will, a competent estate planning lawyer will also provide the healthcare directives. For instance, if you're a coma, you know, allowing your wife to make decisions for you or do banking or whatever she needs to do. Um, uh, also, you know, if you have minor children, you're going to need a guardianship nomination. What if something happens to you and your wife? Um, who's going to raise your children? Um, you know, there are some things that may be appropriate to one estate plan that's not to another, but a competent estate planning lawyer will ask the right questions and give you all the documents that you need, that you're ever going to need. Um, you know, in, in the event that somebody is injured and incapacitated and can't make decisions for themselves, and including in your area, uh, you know, healthcare directives so that the doctor can talk to the spouse or the doctor can talk to your brother about your, your medical needs. And, um, and, and also, the tr as we are talking here today, the living trust and the will to transfer the assets to your loved ones. All those documents are, are necessary in a good, complete estate plan. One of the things that, um, you know, and, and I'm glad you mentioned all that because it's, you know, it's not just uh, issues related to living trust uh, and wills, but there is this comprehensive element that, you know, people don't know about, don't think about, and, you know, most people uh, don't, uh, don't plan the day they die and, and that, you know, that becomes a problem. But um, one of the things that you mentioned too is with regard to the estate, uh, estate tax, you know, people are listening to this thinking, well, you know, I'm not worth, you know, I'm not worth 20, you know, my wife and I are not worth 25 million. But I would just like to point out a couple things. One is that I do know that in, in our group, we have a number of people who are, you know, certainly in the, you know, four or five million plus range. And then they have significant life insurance policies on top of that, where, you know, the life insurance policy certainly, uh, you know, the death, the, the, the payment um, the, uh, that, that your heirs would be getting from your life insurance policy could get you to the point where you're starting to get closer to those, uh, to those uh, estate tax numbers. The other thing to remember about the estate tax is that we, this is about as high as that minimum has ever been. And it's very likely that the estate tax um, minimum will come back down. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm getting asked this a lot lately. So we used to say when Obama was in office during his second term, the, the death tax exemption amount was 5.2 million. And we used to say that's the highest it's ever been. Um, when my father passed right. away, I think it was 1989, the death tax exemption was 600,000. Um, you know, now, if you go and look at some of the platforms um, particularly on the Democratic nominees. For instance, I think I saw somewhere that Bernie Sanders, if, if elected, would um, try and bring that down to $1 million with 55% on every dollar after that. So you're right. This is a moving target. It might be $22 million for a married couple right now, but uh, you know, who knows where it's going to be in the next administration. Certainly, you know, it's something you have to keep an eye on. Like, for instance, I tell my clients who have the four or five million dollar estate, you know, we'll give you, we'll let's just do the basic plan right now. Um, you know, we can do some advanced estate planning techniques if you want, but if not, let's just keep an eye on it because, you know, it may come down and it pro likely will during your lifetime. So we really need to keep an eye on that. And, and, and so, and I, I'm telling clients, like advising right now, look, I don't mean to, you know, bang the drum about the debt tax coming down because there's always rumblings about that, you know, but, but look, we've got until the next administration to do something advanced estate planning wise. So now would be the time to look at it because it is so high. 10 years from now, I don't know, we might be all laughing about, remember when Trump was in office and the debt tax exemption was 22 million because Again, you're right, that's the highest it's ever been by double. So we've got a very high debt tax, which allows us to do some techniques now that might not be available when it comes back down, if that ever happens. I think in Trump's uh, current tax provision um, in 2025, he's got it where the debt tax exemption goes away completely. But remember, this is a moving target. That law could always get changed and applied 
you know, moving forward. And, and by the way, just so we're clear here, the exemption is applied in the, in, during, in the year you pass away. So there was a, uh, during the Bush administration, I, uh, I believe it was 2010, there was a lapse in the debt tax for that one year. And, uh, and, and, and they always pointed out in my estate planning periodicals that George Steinbrenner, the owner of the New York Yankees, strategically died during that year so that his children could inherit that team tax-free, which they ended yeah. up doing. So, yeah. so that was the one year that I know yeah. of. That or or the children no strategically made it so he died. Yeah, there are a lot of Red Sox fans who think he did that on purpose. But, but, but he strategically <laughs> passed away during that year, and there was no death tax exemption at that time. But that's the only year that I'm aware of that there was no death tax exemption. Yeah. Uh, you also mentioned the idea of, you know, doing something while the, uh, you know, while the exemption is a little higher. Um, and is that in part the idea, the thinking there that you might sort of grandfather into something? That's right. If you look at the history of the, um, t you know, the code, the tax code and the way they implement these laws, they typically, uh, when they, when they pass new legislation regarding the estate tax, it's, it's from that point forward. They, they typically don't make it retroactive. So that's, you're right. That's why my statement is now's a good time to look at some advanced estate, tannic, uh, estate planning techniques because you're right, you use the term grandfather. You t you probably will be grandfathered into the new the new the new law if it ever gets implemented. so. Th meaning that whatever techniques that are currently available to us right now could potentially be outlawed. Um, it's very unlikely, but yeah, it's it, 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 it's it's possible. But typically, they don't make them re retroactive. It's going forward. So, for instance, like I said earlier. Um, if they change the law, let's just say we get a new administration January 1st of 2021, right? Um, it's once they, let's just say they pass a new comprehensive uh, tax overhaul in, in June of 2021 to be implemented on January, 20, January 1st of 2022. Typically, you would have to die after January 1st, 2022. Um, um, to have the current law applied. Now, if you did any estate planning techniques prior to that, for instance, um, you, you, you did a technique that saved on debt taxes during your lifetime, those would still be valid. They would not, they would not be retroactive and, and, disimply, and, and somehow take away the estate planning that you did. Because again, the laws are applied um, going forward, not retroactively. So it's very unlikely that they would you give a disc I know it's going to be totally hypothetical, but just so that people understand what you're talking about there, I mean, is it like gifting or, or things that you could do now that you might not be able to do later, but you, because you've already sort of put things in, in motion, you may have an ability to continue doing something like that? Yeah, let's talk about gifting. You bring up, this is one good estate planning technique uh, to avoid debt tax. So gifting, what is that? So uh, this might sound confusing, but follow me. Um, you also have a lifetime gift exemption of 11.4 million, okay? And um, so what you're allowed to do is, you're allowed to give your child um, up to 11.4 million. So let's just say you give your child during your lifetime four, half, half ownership in a piece of real estate that's worth $5 million. And now your child has gotten uh, two and a half million, okay? Which, you know, at that point, that roughly leaves around nine million left in your lifetime um, gift exclusion. It also leaves nine million left in your death tax exclusion too, because whatever you use during the lifetime gift exclusion gets applied to when you pass away on the death taxes. Now, you've given away the two and a half million in real estate. It's now going to grow outside of your state. You're not going to owe any death tax on it. That real estate grows in value from a value of five million, and then you pass away, and it's worth twelve million. Well, only six million of it now gets put into your state for that forty percent death tax calculation. The other six is owned by your child, and that's subject to no tax whatsoever. Okay. Now, let's just say you did that technique, and then you pass away. Um, um, that technique. Um, will not be voided by the new debt tax legislation, okay? Because you gave away 
six, you gave away half of that real estate worth two and a half million at a time when it was valid, when you could do that. And it's now in your child's hands. It's a gift, okay? And it's now, and will not be taxed right. um, in your estate. Yeah, good. Well, I mean, I think that that basically sort of sums it up. Um, are there, other than gifting, any examples of, you know, different kinds of strategies for at the higher level that, that you have put in place for clients who might start be, um, you know, start being in the position where they're concerned about estate taxes? Uh, yeah, they're, you know, like we said, the simple one is, you know, buying life insurance and putting it in an irrevocable life insurance trust. Um, that, those proceeds, if they're in an irrevocable life insurance trust, will come upon your passing, will be distributed um, to the trust tax-free, and that money could go to pay debt taxes. Another technique that's mm -hmm. popular, particularly with real estate investors, is what we call discounting. So let's say you have a family-owned limited partnership or a family-owned LLC, okay? Um, the, currently, the IRS code says, um, and let's just say upon your death, that LLC or limited partnerships worth um, $10 million. Okay. Um, for death tax purposes, um, the IRS says it's actually worth, you know, seven or $8 million. You can discount it because it's a family owned company. Therefore you wouldn't, if you want to try to sell a share of that to an outside bona fide third party, it's not worth full value because uh, nobody's going to buy an interest in a family run company when you're in a non family. Okay. And the theory, and there's case right. law to support this, what we call discounting technique. And so a lot of, a lot of real estate investors like the family owned limited partnership, the family owned uh, LLCs and their asset protected entities too. So you get a, you get a, some nice asset protection features. You get some nice discounting features upon your death and which dovetails into some good estate planning. That's an, that's another advanced estate planning technique. Are there sometimes issues with, you know, and I found some of some of this to be true, where your goals on the asset protection front, the goals on the estate planning, the goals on your current taxes, all these start to conflict. And how do you navigate that? You know, it. it you're right. Um, well, the goals that typically for the the uh, you know the typical family, you're right. Um, it's where are my income tax savings? Where are my capital gains savings during my lifetime? And then where's my estate tax savings upon my death? With a competent estate planning lawyer, <clears throat> there is a bit of, you know, overall tax strategy going into the estate plan. And that includes taxes during your lifetime and taxes on your death. So if you have a competent estate planner, you'll cover all those goals in one package. Okay, got it. So Joe, one of the things that we could clearly, I think, can get uh, from this interview is that you need to find a competent estate planning attorney. I know you are based in California. Um, tell us how to get in touch with you, but also tell us for people who are, you know, presumably in other states, uh, it, you know, if it makes sense uh, to have somebody from out of state or should they be looking for somebody in state and how would they do that? Yeah, estate planning is typically a state by state um, um, uh, process because each state has their own state laws related to estate planning. And then there are some federal laws, particularly on the tax side, that apply. So, so whatever state you're in, you want to find a qualified estate planner in your state. Like, uh, and, and one of the resources I use is I'm a member of a nationwide group called the Wealth Council, and their website's wealthcouncil.com. They have a really good directory in there of, you know, that by city, by state, and I find, and you know, and I have clients that, you know, I'm in California, but I have clients who have a piece of property in Oklahoma that I need to put into a California trust, and and I reach out to one of my Wealth Council colleagues in Oklahoma. I always find them to be so friendly and so helpful. And so I think wealthcouncil.com is where I would start if you're looking for an estate planner. Uh, the website also has very good information on, you know, estate planning in general. Um, um, I, I, I serve all of California out here. I'm a partner in a law firm 
uh, Glazer Weil, which their their main office is in Century City, and um, you know we 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 handle all most areas of law, um, and I'm I'm one of uh, several estate planners within our practice, and um, I would say most estate planners these days are doing a lot of their estate plans on flat fees. Um, when I first started, everybody pretty much did hourly rates, and and a lot of estate planners still do. It just depends on the estate. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm finding more and more now that estate planners, once they interview the client, most 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 initial consults are free. So you get to talk to the lawyer, finds out what your goals are, what your issues are, what your assets are. I find that most lawyers now will will quote a flat fee so that you know how much it's going to cost you for the estate plan up front. And it's, it's also how I operate too on flat fees, just because clients like cost certainty and uh, they don't have this mystery of what, how, what the hour is. And I also like that my clients can call me, you know, six months from now and say, Hey Joe, I bought a house in Palm Springs. I forgot, you know, how to title it in the name of my trust. Can you help? It's real simple for me to do to help you on that. And, and I don't want to send out another bill for a five minute phone call, which, you know, that that's, I, I know it's, 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 it's the way, you know, law is set up, but I think in this area of law, you know, it's not too difficult to advise a client on how to title their home. Yeah. That sounds great. So Joe Longo, if you're in uh, California, definitely look him. And Joe, I do want to thank you again for being on Wealth Formula podcast today. Thank you very much, Buck. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Be right back. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, if you took nothing else away from that interview, let me summarize the bare essentials just so that you have a plan of action, you know, so you have a call to action. This is exactly what you need to do if you don't already have it. Regardless of who you are, you need to have a will and you need to have a living trust. You have to have those things. Furthermore, you need to own everything through your living trust, even your LLCs. It's that simple. So, of course, we've talked before about investing, you know, from LLCs, uh, out of LLCs rather than personally. And, and some people do that. I certainly do that. But those LLCs got to be owned by somebody or something, right? So what do they got to be owned by? They got to not be owned by you personally. They've got to be owned by trusts. And these 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 living uh, trusts are so simple. You don't even have a tax ID. And when you sign up for something, all you do is write your name and living trust. That's it. It's that simple. And then it can really, really make your uh, family so much safer. Anyway, it's that simple. If you do nothing else, take away that. Go get it done. Um, you know, use the site that Joe talked about. He's a really good guy. If you're in California, use him. Now, uh, on another note, I want to make sure that um, you know uh, something else. We, we sent out an email earlier in the year because people wanted to know when the next Wealth Formula meetup was. And initially we thought, well, it looks like March, for, you know, mid-March sounds like a good time. And as it turns out, we had speakers who, um, after the fact, could not make it, realized uh, that they had vacations and stuff like that. So we did have to reschedule. This one is in stone, though, April 24th and April 25th. In Phoenix, Scottsdale is the next Wealth Formula meetup. And we will actually start sort of promoting that uh, right after the new year, I think. But make sure uh, that you mark your calendar April 24th and 25th uh, in uh, Phoenix for the next Wealth Formula meetup. Again, uh, in the meantime, you know, these communities are great. But remember, you can get involved with Wealth Formula Network, which is our private community. Go to wealthformularoadmap.com. Starts with a course, ends with a community, bi-weekly Zoom video calls and uh, Facebook community, et cetera. Lots of fun. It's where all the magic happens. Check it out, wellformularoadmap.com. That's it for me this week. This is Buck Joffrey signing off.